Good evening. Let's start with the word of the Lord this evening. In the second letter of Paul to Timothy, Paul says to young pastor Timothy, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him. And if someone likewise competes as an athlete, he is not crowned as victor unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory." The statement is trustworthy, for if we died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. Remind them of these things and solemnly exhort them in the presence of God not to dispute about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the listeners. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, claiming that the resurrection has already taken place, and they are jeopardizing the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to keep away from wickedness. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver implements, but also implements of wood and of earthenware and Some are for honor, while others are for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be an implement for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, skillful in teaching, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will." But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such people as these. For among them are those who slip into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, 
men of depraved mind, worthless in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their foolishness will be obvious to all, just as was that also of Jonas and Jambres. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened at me or to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who want to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil people and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I solemnly exhort you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, use self-restraint in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Would you pray with me? Father, you have spoken through your prophet Isaiah that as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, causing seed to sprout, giving bread to the eater, so in the same way will your word be which comes out of your mouth. It will, not, it will not return to you void or empty without accomplishing everything that you have caused it to happen, that you are going to make happen. And so, Father, we turn to your word, its authority, its timelessness. We rejoice in what it shows us. And Father, as we turn to the early church tonight, God, I pray that they would also stand as a witness of those who have followed your word, obeyed your word, listened to its apostolic authority, and have received the reward as a result. So Father, we ask you to be with us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So, welcome to class number two on the early church. Uh, this evening, we're going to be launching into our first key figure, a man by the name of Polycarp, and uh, the overarching theme that we're going to get to here in a little bit is that of apostolic authority, and we'll explain a little bit what, uh, what I mean by that here in a few minutes. Um, but this evening, I want to start where we left off last week. And uh, I want to maybe just do a quick review. Before we get to the review, I should probably explain your handouts. Um, you had two uh, bundles of handouts as you came in this evening. Uh, the first one should be a couple of pages. That is your lesson, as well as a biography of Polycarp. And then the next bundle are three readings or three letters, which a man by the name of Ignatius wrote. So those first two can go in your section under Polycarp in your binder. The, uh, the letters uh, that Ignatius wrote, they can go under the next section uh, marked in your binder there under Ignatius, and that'll be for next week, and I'll explain more of that when we get there this evening. So any questions about the binders? Just uh, throwing a lot at you, but uh, there's a purpose for it. So. 
So what we want to do this evening is we want to begin again with the myths that often surround the early church and debunk those, which is what we did last week, but we really didn't give any time for discussion. And so I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, there's nine myths, there's probably dozens more that could have been listed, but we went with these nine as probably the top the top nine, I guess you could say. And so I just want to run through these again and maybe have some discussion. If you have questions, please raise your hand. And uh, if this isn't clear at all or whatever, just uh, this is the time for that, okay? So let me start through these. We'll run through them and have some discussion here by way of review. First of all, the first myth that I presented to you last week is that church history is unnecessary. All we need is the Bible. There are those out there who would wholeheartedly agree with that statement. We don't need to study the early church. We don't need to study about this guy Polycarp. We don't need to study about the reformers. We don't need to study about the Puritans. All these guys are just inconsequential. All we need is the Bible, right? Well, as we debunked that myth last week, we pointed, out, pointed to this reality that, yes, indeed, the Bible is the final, ultimate authority for truth, faith, and practice, But much benefit comes from knowing and recognizing, and this is a very specifically uh, intentionally used word here, that the authority of the church is history. This is beneficial to us, and we also need to recognize it as having an element of authority to it. Now, I made the distinction last week, this is not the same idea that Roman Catholicism would give to the tradition or the history of the church, whereas they see scripture and the tradition of the church as being equals. We as Protestants would reject that out of hand, and instead we see it more as a, uh, a pyramid, right? We've got Scripture at the very top. That is the final, ultimate authority of all truth, practice, and faith, right? But we also have, you know, in this pyramid here, we have other various authorities that are underneath that Scripture, right? So we have like the elders of the church. We have governments. We have, you know, different things that we could put under that, including the history of the church, It carries a certain weight of authority, but it is not equal to Scripture, right? Only Scripture is inerrant, infallible. The early church, as as amazing as they were, they made mistakes from time to time. So just for that reason alone, we would understand that Scripture and the early early church are not on an equal level. Instead, Scripture is above, but at the same time, we don't want to reject early church history as having no relevance, okay? So any questions with that one? Are we on the same page there? Okay. Myth number two, and hopefully we'll just kind of go through these quick, but at the same time, if you do have questions, please raise your hand. Myth, Catholic is synonymous with Roman Catholic and should be rejected, right? That word Catholic, oftentimes people don't want to study, believe it or not, the early church because they use this word Catholic a lot. And boy, that just sounds a lot like Roman Catholic, and boy, we should really stay away from that. So, the myth. The word Catholic is the same as Roman Catholic and should be rejected. Well, the reality of that is, is that Catholic, the word Catholic, just simply means universal and is therefore appropriate, an appropriate description of Christ's church and is often used by the early church. The word Catholic is not a word we should be afraid of. And uh, we'll probably make that distinction, and, and uh, you'll probably see it in the writings. Oftentimes, Catholic is used with a lowercase c. Uh, in modern times, when you see Roman Catholic, it's with a capital C, and it's meaning something different than what the early church intended for it to mean. I also pointed out that Roman Catholic is somewhat of an oxymoronic term. Catholic meaning universal, but yet then they come and apply the word Roman to it, which makes it a very distinct, a very specific thing, and in a sense that's kind of a, you know, those are opposing thoughts and opposing philosophies. So anyway, like I said last week, you can challenge your Roman Catholic friends with that, say, hey, how come the name of your organization is oxymoronic? And uh, anyway, number three, any questions about that? word Catholic. Are we okay with Catholic? We're going to use that word tonight. We're going to see it um, in in, uh, Polycarp's martyrdom. I think we'll we'll find it there. We might see it a couple other places. Are we okay with that word? Okay. Myth number three, orthodoxy is a bad word. 
So kind of like, you know, the whole stigma behind the word Catholic that, oh, we got to stay away from anything Catholic. Uh, is, is, is orthodoxy kind of that same thing, that it's a bad word, we should stay away from it? Well, the reality is that orthodoxy is a term meaning right doctrine. So how many of you are um, passionate about right doctrine? Then you are passionate about orthodoxy, right? Orthodoxy is not a bad word. It is just a word meaning right doctrine. The early church believed this was knowable, worthy of defending, and to be pursued at all cost. Any questions there? We also mentioned last week that orthodoxy leads to another word, orthopraxy, which means right practice. So right doctrine will lead to right practice. The early church believed this fiercely. You get, you get this book right, you understand this book properly, then your life will flow accordingly, right? It'll, it'll fall in line also. Number four, bishop, uh, bishop myth. I tried to say myth and bishop at the same time. Bishop is another bad word. Reality, in the early church, the bishop represents the same thing as the modern pastor. So we'll talk more about this next week when we come to Ignatius because he talks about this idea of the bishops and the presbyters and the deacons. Um, he uses them in conjunction, and he recognizes those three levels of leadership in the church, and much of the early church uh, followed suit. They understood that the bishop was an elder among elders, the distinction being is that the bishop had a gift of teaching, and so he was the one that was called to be the, the, the preacher, uh, and they you know, designated him with a specific term of overseer or, or bishop, the Greek word is episkopos. And, uh, and so what we find is that the bishop is the same thing that we would uh, say today about the pastor, right? Same, same office in the church, okay? Any questions there? Again, you know, these are probably, you know, Catholic, Orthodox, uh, bishop, you know, these are probably terms that um, because of our modern culture, we're, we're probably going to have to adjust our thinking a little bit because if we're honest, those are words that probably... Um, catch our attention in a bad way, right? And so we, we do have to retrain ourselves as we're, as we're studying the early church, but bishop is not a bad word either, okay? Number five, myth. The early church practiced idolatry through art and icons. Reality, for the most part, the early church saw images, artwork, and icons as a way to honor Christ, remember the faith of notable disciples, and to teach biblical truth, right? So you see these, I'm putting these pictures up here of, you know, these handsome men in their robes with uh, usually three crosses on it, and they're usually holding a jeweled Bible, you know, and, and they're doing this weird hand sign, you know, their they're, uh, they're, uh, they're Greek gang sign, you know, they're making uh, the symbols of the letters of Christ. And, and, and we look at that and we think, well, I mean, what was the early church doing? Were they worshiping these people? And that's not the case at all. Uh, in reality, it'd be nothing different than today, a church that has stained glass windows uh, depicting Christ or stories from the Bible. And, and uh, what the early church did is they didn't, they didn't idolize these people, but they had a serious honor and respect for them. And so as a result, they wanted to remember what they had done, you know, the theology that they had worked out and the, and the uh, you know, some of them performed miracles and some of them uh, stood firm against governments and all sorts of great, you know, um, acts of faith. And so the church wanted to preserve that. And so oftentimes they had paintings um, made of these guys and depicted, but they weren't worshiping them in any way. But sometimes you hear this that, uh, you know, oh, you want to study the early church? Well, you know, they're just a bunch of idol worshipers and they just got it all wrong. And so anyway, but that is a myth. Okay. Any questions there? Okay. Number six, myth. The early church was always persecuted in every place, right? A lot of times we have this idea that, boy, from the time that the church was born until, you know, sometime up until maybe Constantine in the 300s, that the church was just persecuted just relentlessly. But that necessarily wasn't the case. Reality is that the persecution of early Christians, with a couple of exceptions, was sporadic and it was localized. Right? It wasn't just this constant persecution of the Christians by the Roman Empire all the time. Now, there were a couple of notable uh, exceptions. Uh, for example, under the reign of Emperor Nero, under Domitian, Diocletian, where it was more widespread, it was a lot more fierce, and, uh, and you know, empire-wide. But for the most part, um, 
you know, there would be a, a, uh, a persecution that would pop up in this region of Europe, and then, you know, it would die out after a few months, maybe, and then some other time down the road in a different location, it would pop up again in a different place. It wasn't empire-wide, except for those few exceptions that I mentioned there, so... That's important to understand as well. Number seven, early Christians and Jews had nothing to do with each other, right? So oftentimes, you know, we see, um, you know, the rise of Christianity as being completely separate from the Jewish culture, uh, the nation of Israel. Well, the reality, and, and this, is, this is probably obvious, but at the same time, it's, it's almost uh, groundbreaking, earth shattering. You know, it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's so obvious that I didn't realize how important that statement is. But the reality is this, the first Christians were Jews, right? The first Christians were Jews. And like I said, that's an obvious statement, but uh, for some reason maybe we take it for granted too much. It seems like a profound statement. Like, oh yeah, okay, they, they were Jews, right? Also, along with that, the first persecutors of Christians were Jews, right? The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Apostle Paul. And not only that, but the first Christian martyrs were Jews, right? Stephen, who was stoned in the book of Acts, he was a Jew. So there's a close relationship between the early days of Christianity and that of the Jewish culture, okay? That's important. Now, that'll evolve later on, right? Because as Christianity spreads, you know, we get into Greek cultures, we get into the Roman culture, and, and uh, we'll talk about that more as we go throughout this study. Number eight, myth, the early church did not have the books of the New Testament until the fourth century when Emperor Constantine published them. And uh, I just, I love Constantine because he's just, you know, everybody wants to assign all these conspiracy theories to Constantine, the emperor of Rome in the, you know, in the fourth century. And, you know, they blame him for all the corruption of the Bible, you know, because the Bible's corrupt, you know, and it must be Constantine who did that, you know, and all sorts of things come out of, out of, uh, studies about Constantine. Truth of the matter is, Constantine may or may not have been a Christian. What we do know about Constantine is that he was theologically confused and that he also granted a lot of privileges and a lot of freedoms to Christians uh, that they didn't experience before he came along, right? So um, anyway, so myth is that, you know, the church didn't have the books of the Bible until Constantine decided, hey, I think that'll be a good book, that'll be a good book, and that'll be a good book. Here you go, church, here's your Bible, Right? And some people believe that, believe it or not. You can go on the internet and find people that'll support that. Reality. The earliest witness of the liturgies, right, the worship schedules, and the writings of the church includes the books of the New Testament. And we're going to see this on full display this evening when we study the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians. We're going to see that Scripture is all over the place. And he's writing in about the year 130 A.D., 140 A.D. maybe. So... We need to, any questions there? Okay, and the last one, myth. Apostolic succession refers to the succession of Roman popes and should be rejected, right? So Rome has this teaching um, based on the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am, right? He, well, first he says, well, who are the people saying that I am? And they say, well, you know, you're John the Baptist back from the dead. You're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And, and so then he turns to his disciples, his 12 disciples, and says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter steps forward, and in a, uh, a brilliant moment where he actually gets something right for a change, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, well done, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Rome interprets that as upon the rock of Peter, the church is being built. And through Peter and the apostolic succession of popes, the church is being built, with Peter being supposedly the first pope. Okay? What we understand as the interpretation of that and understand it rightly is that Jesus is not declaring the church to be built on a person, but rather on a statement of faith. Upon this rock is Peter's statement. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that, Jesus is building his church. Not on a person, but rather on that 
statement of faith, that rule of faith, we might even say, which is what I've got here. The early church recognized apostolic succession as being contained in the faithful preservation and passing on of the rule of faith contained in the teaching of the apostles of Christ. Does that make sense, that one? I, I don't know if I explained that very well. So Roman Catholicism would say that the church is being built on a person, namely Peter and the succession of popes after him, which fail, right? I mean, Peter failed. You want to build your, you know, place your hope completely in him, right? Or Protestants, as we would say as well, no, it's the statement of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that, our life and our doctrine and our church is built, right? Any questions? I skipped over it because we didn't have time. So maybe we'll come back to that in future lesson. I know we, we skipped over those. There's four blanks there. Four reasons why we should study the early church. Is that what it was? Something like that. Or study church history. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll maybe come back to that. We, we really didn't have time then, and we really don't have time this evening. So very observant, though. I can't sneak anything by you guys. That's, I don't know if that's good or bad. but <laughs> Right. I, I need to give you less blanks. You'll notice this evening I only gave you six blanks to fill in, so you can thank me later. So, as far as the demythology, yeah, Janet? I think that a little bit, it's just trying to find the Bible and hearing the early kingdom of Israel, Quite possibly, you know. I mean, uh, you know, it's, yeah. But in both instances, they're taking the Bible tradition and using it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it kind of comes back to, you know, the sermon from last Sunday. There's two kingdoms. Which kingdom do we want to build our life on? The kingdom of the world, which is the kingdom of man, or the kingdom of God, which is Christ and his throne, you know. So, anyway, kind of the same idea, though, possibly, that. You know, we, we, want a, we want a person, we want, a, we want somebody we can see, somebody who sits on an actual throne that we can, you know, that we can honor and bow down to, and, and uh, yeah. Any other questions on the demythology portion here before we move on? Okay, so let's jump into Polycarp this evening, and I want to uh, introduce you to this great man of God, a great person of faith who uh, stood upon apostolic authority for everything that he did. And uh, so by way of a biography and introduction, which is your second page that you should have received this evening, let's just take a moment, let me introduce you to him and say some things about him. We don't know a ton about him, uh, but what we do know is very important. So first of all, uh, Polycarp was born in 65 AD, which was during the reign of Emperor Nero. And uh, you may recall from last week as we went through a timeline of the Roman Empire uh, that this was a time of persecution of the Christians, right? So in 64 AD, um, there's the great fire of Rome and uh, Nero blames the Christians for it, out of which comes a time of persecution. It was probably during that time that Peter and Paul were martyred in the city of Rome and, uh, but in the midst of that, we find this man Polycarp being born. Now, the location of his birth, we have no idea, no clue. We do know this, though, that he served as the bishop of Smyrna for somewhere between 40 and 60 years. Now, this is incredible, and this is just, it gives you a glimpse into the perspective and the philosophy of ministry of the early church. Today, the average lifespan of a pastor in a church is three to five years. The early church understood that once appointed to a church, you're going to stay there till you die. You're not church hopping to try to climb the ladder to get more, more notoriety or a bigger congregation. Once you come to a church and you're the pastor of the church, you're there. And so we see this in Polycarp that uh, possibly for as many as 60 years he served this church. Okay? So where is it? We'll show you on this uh, handy dandy map. 
And uh, we find, to get our bearings, we have Jerusalem down here, Bethlehem, Nazareth. Up here we have Antioch. Antioch is an important city. We'll see that next week. That's where Ignatius is the, bis is the bishop of. He's the bishop of Antioch. We find over here we have uh, Greece and Corinth. And then right here in the middle is the region of Galatia, right? So that's what uh, Paul wrote the, the letter to the Galatian, excuse me, Galatian churches. He wrote it to the churches in this region. And in here we see, uh, we see Ephesus. We see Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamum, and right here on the coast, we see the little town of Smyrna, and that's where Polycarp pastored for 40 to 60 years, okay? Now, along with that, some scholars suggest that Polycarp is the angel of the church in Smyrna referenced in Revelation 2, 8 through 11. Your paper says chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. It's actually chapter 2. I, I printed that out before I caught the error there. So you can cross that 3 out and put in a 2. But some would go so far, and this is speculation, right? We can't know this for sure. We can get to heaven. We can ask the Lord about it. But right now, this is really speculation. We don't know this for sure. But some scholars do say that this, this passage in Revelation where, you know, you remember, um, you know, Jesus is speaking to the seven churches, and he's speaking to the angels of the churches. The angels of the churches are the pastors, the bishops of the churches. And, uh, and they would say that, well, you know, as far as the timeline is concerned, this would fit that Polycarp was the bishop at Smyrna during this time when John wrote the letter of Revelation. So if we turn to Revelation, it says, Jesus speaking, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? I, angel, we're identifying here as the bishop, the pastor, the leader of the church. Write this, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. All right, that's still going on today. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death or the final judgment, right? The great white throne judgment. And uh, another clue to this is that Polycarp's life ends by way of martyrdom, right? He is arrested and he is put to death. And uh, so some, some scholars put this together and say, well, there's no reason not to believe that Jesus here is referencing Polycarp when he's referencing Smyrna. And uh, anyway, that's, you know... Maybe a fun thing to think about, probably not something that you want to stand upon dogmatically and uh, cause a big debate over. Another thing that we need to know about Polycarp is that he was discipled by the Apostle John. So what we're talking about when we're talking about Polycarp is we're talking about a second generation Christian or disciple. So we got Jesus taught John, John taught Polycarp. And not only that, but I think there's good reason to believe that Polycarp received his appointment as the bishop of Smyrna by John. Um, we'll see this here in a minute, but uh, um, one of our other key figures by the name of Irenaeus, he talks about this, that Polycarp was appointed by the apostles, and uh, most notably probably by John. So. Also, Polycarp, we need to recognize, was a close friend with Ignatius, who is the bishop of Antioch, as I mentioned earlier, right? So they are, um, they are alive at the same time. As a matter of fact, it's probably right to believe that Ignatius was also a disciple of John. Uh, they were contemporaries of each other, and they were friends. They, they knew each other. And uh, we'll, we'll get more to that this evening. You'll see that a little more clearly. And then we have a guy by the name of Irenaeus, which we'll study in a couple of weeks that Irenaeus sat under Polycarp's teaching as a youth. And uh, it's interesting. So we have Jesus taught John. John taught Polycarp. Polycarp taught Irenaeus. And there is this succession of teaching of the faith of Jesus Christ that we see. And, and that all kind of plays into where we're going this evening. But um, 
you know, what would that have been like? You know, to sit under the teaching of John the Beloved. Or to sit under the teaching of Polycarp, who sat under the teaching of John the Beloved. Well, in a way, through the preservation of the writings of the early church, we can do that. So, it's very cool. So, Irenaeus, interestingly enough, probably gives us the most information about Polycarp that we have today. And so, I just want to give you four testimonies that, that Irenaeus... Um, the Irenaeus' writings refer to him. And so the first one is in Irenaeus' book Against Heresies, and he says this, but Polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also by apostles in Asia appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna. So that's the reference I was telling you about a moment ago. Whom I also saw in my early youth, for he tarried on earth a very long time, right? So Polycarp... Um, probably lived to the age of 86. And when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffered martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles and which the church has handed down and which alone are true. So what a, what a great testimony, um, you know, a great, a great uh, witness to the faithfulness of Polycarp. We also find a little bit longer one here where Irenaeus says, For I have a more vivid recollection of what occurred at that time than of recent times, inasmuch as the experiences of childhood, keeping pace with the growth of the soul, become incorporated with it. So Irenaeus is essentially saying there with a lot of words, um, I remember my childhood really, really well, better than I do now as an old man. I can't remember what happened yesterday, right? And uh, some of us can identify. And he goes on to say, so that I can even describe the place where the blessed Polycarp used to sit and discourse, his going out to and his coming in, his general mode of life and personal appearance, together with the discourses which he delivered to the people. Also how he would speak of his familiar, uh, familiar relations with John and with the rest of those who had seen the Lord, and how he would call their words to remembrance. Whatsoever things he had heard from them respecting the Lord both with regard to his miracles and his teaching, Polycarp, having thus received information from the eyewitnesses of the word of life, would recount them all in harmony with the scriptures. These things, through God's mercy which was upon me, I then listened to attentively. And so Irenaeus is just once again giving this testimony of, of, of his remembrance as a, as a youth when he used to sit under Polycarp's teaching. And used to listen to him tell stories about, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the miracles that John had told him about and that Jesus had done and, and the teachings that go along with that. And so, again, just, uh, just an incredible thought to have, you know, to sit under that kind of a, of a direct influence and, uh, and to hear it. And interestingly enough, Irenaeus mentions all these things but doesn't give us any details. You know, he sat under the discourses of Polycarp, but doesn't give any details of what those discourses actually were, other than the faithful teaching of Scripture about Christ. We can also gain a little bit of information about what Polycarp was like in a couple of instances which Irenaeus talks about, and uh, the first of which is a situation um, that happened in Rome with the pastor in Rome, and there was this... Um, or no, wait a minute, that's the next one. First of all is the one with Marcion. So we're going to talk about Marcion when we come back to Irenaeus. Marcion was a leader of a heretical group. Um, the Marcionites, you, uh, this ironically enough is still around today too. So the, the fundamental teaching of Marcion is that there's an Old Testament God and there's a New Testament God. And the whole goal of salvation and redemption is to get rid of the Old Testament God. Right, so... Um, Andy Stanley has been accused of teaching this, right? We need to get rid of the Old Testament so we can get rid of the Old Testament God who is wrathful and full of anger and just wants to kill everybody and judge everybody. And we just need to focus on the New Testament God, which is Jesus, which is peace and love, right? And Andy Stanley has come under a lot of fire for being a Marcionite, essentially. But where did that all get its roots? Well, clear back, clear back uh, in the early church, believe it or not, that uh, as truth was being brought out and the church was growing, we also find that heresies were growing up along with them, and uh, Irenaeus 
Um, we're going to talk a lot about that when we get to Irenaeus and how the church dealt with those things. But, but here we find um, a testimony of when Polycarp came into you know, confrontation of sorts with Marcion, the guy who led this, this heresy of two gods. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of comical. I, I, it's a good witness, but it's also a little bit comical. And Irenaeus says this, And Polycarp himself replied to Marcion, who met him on one occasion and said, Dost thou know me? Right? Um, Marcion wants to know, Hey, Polycarp, you're kind of an important guy. I'm important too. Do you know who I am? And Polycarp responds, I do know thee, the firstborn of Satan. <laughs> right? Because he had started this whole heretical movement of two gods. Such was the horror which the apostles and their disciples had against holding even verbal communication with any corruptors of the truth. As Paul also says, a man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Right? So, um, they took heresy very, very seriously in the early church. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So on the other side of that, let's get another picture of Polycarp here and another bit of uh, debate or tension that happened in his life. And this happened to be with the Bishop of Rome. Okay, so I'm getting to where I thought I was at earlier. And, uh, and it says this, Irenaeus again is giving the account. And he says, and when the blessed Polycarp was sojourning in Rome in the time of Anicetus, and so that's the pastor of Rome at the time, Anicetus. Although a slight controversy had arisen among them as to certain other points, they were at once well inclined towards each other with regard to the matter in hand, not willing that any quarrels should arise between them upon this head or this issue. So here's the, here's the deal, right? So in the early church, um, when the church was going uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, you had to fast ahead of time. So if we're going to have the Lord's Supper this Sunday like we always do, then it's expected that on Saturday the church is fasting. If you're going to have communion on Sunday morning, you're fasting Saturday. So the details of that came into question. Well, what exactly is a fast? Is that from sunrise to sunset? Or is that a 24-hour uh, period of time? Uh, is it one day? Is it two days? Is it three days? How much fasting is necessary? And so there was this controversy that kind of propped up in, or cropped up in the church um, on, on, yeah, we all agree that we need to fast before we have communion, but what exactly does a fast mean? And so there was uh, Polycarp who had this idea, and there was the church in Rome that had a different idea of what, what the requirement of fasting looked like, Okay. And so this is the situation. So when Polycarp comes into Rome and, uh, and there's this issue and he's talking to the, to the pastor in Rome, um, it says here that though it was a controversy, though it was an important point, they were at once well inclined towards each other re with regard to the matter in hand, not willing that any quarrel should arise between them upon this issue, right? So it's... You know, uh, let's, let's put it in a modern perspective, right? So some churches, when they baptize people, they sprinkle. Others dunk. Which is right, which is wrong? Well, there's good debate for both. So we can have debates, but at the end of the day, we don't need to divide over it. Why? Because it's a secondary issue. And Polycarp was wise enough to see that. So you fast from sunrise to sunset, or you fast for 24 hours. You're still fasting, and we can, you know, maybe we can talk about that, but we don't have to divide over it. Great wisdom, right? So let's go on and read about it. Uh, for neither could Anicetus persuade Polycarp to forego the observance in his own way, inasmuch as these things had been always so observed by John, the disciple of our Lord, and by other apostles with whom he had been conversant. So Polycarp's position is, hey, John taught me this right? John said, this is, this is the way you fast before you take communion, 
right? And all the apostles are doing it this way. So, you know, Anicetus, you need to modify the way you guys are doing it, right? Well, how does Anicetus respond? On the other hand, could Polycarp succeed in persuading Anicetus to keep the observance in his way, for he maintained that he was bound to adhere to the usage of the presbyters who preceded him? So, you know what? This is the way our church has always been doing it. So maybe that's how John did it, but, you know, this is how the, we've always been doing it, you know, and if you track back, you know, to the origin of the church, well, you've got Peter and Paul, so, you know, who's right, who's wrong, right? So it kind of comes to a head, and nobody really gets any ground here. And in this state of affairs, they held fellowship with each other. And Anicetus conceded to Polycarp in the church the celebration of the Lord's Supper by way of showing him respect, so that they parted in peace one from the other, maintaining peace with the whole church, both those who did observe this custom and those who did not. So at the end of the day, they just kind of agreed to disagree, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't split. The church wasn't split because of it. And I think it's interesting to note that if we take those two examples, the one with Marcion, where Marcion is a known heretic, he's been, he's, he's been called to repentance several times, admonished to change his ways, change his teachings, he refuses to do so, and so therefore they consider him as an unbeliever and will not have any fellowship with him. On the other hand, we have this issue within the church and uh, hey, you know what? We can just, we can get along over this. It's a secondary issue. It's not worth dividing over. And as I was thinking about that today, the modern church is the exact opposite, right? Like Lodine pointed out, we're willing to embrace the heretic, but not so much the person who says, oh no, you need to sprinkle your, bap your baptismal candidate, not dunk them. Well, I'm going to divide with you. I'm never going to talk. I'm never going to set foot in that church ever again, right? Completely opposite mindset. So, that was a challenge to me this morning. Maybe it is to you too. All right, we need to keep moving because we're way running out of time here. Furthermore, uh, Polycarp died as a martyr around 150, 160 AD. You know, those dates are contested, but it's probably sometime within that, within that decade. His martyrdom is recorded in the document, the martyrdom of Polycarp, and the only personal writing of Polycarp to survive is his letter to the Philippians, which you all possess. Okay, any questions there about his biography or introduction to his life? Any comment, thoughts? Okay, let's keep going, otherwise I'm going to have you here till midnight. So let's get to the letter of Polycarp itself. And uh, I don't know how many of you had a chance to read this this week. Some of you did, good, good. Um, if you didn't, that's okay, because we're going we're gonna to attempt to read it in class this evening and uh, make some observations so the background of the letter is this, and you'll see this if you read the letter, but the Philippians have written to Polycarp requesting the letters of Ignatius and instruction in righteousness, to which Polycarp writes this letter giving the church in Philippi godly instruction, right? So as we'll see for next week, Ignatius is arrested. He's on his way to Rome to be executed. Along the way, he writes seven letters. And the Philippians, are they, they know that Polycarp has possession of these letters, and so they're writing to him, give us a copy of those letters, and while you're doing it, why don't you just instruct us, Polycarp, about righteousness in Christ? And so that is really the background and the thrust of this letter. Um, major observation, and this kind of comes back to the theme of this evening's lesson, which we're kind of just barely touching on, but, but the source of Polycarp's instruction about righteousness is the apostolic authority handed down to the church, right? So where does he get the things that he says in this letter? Does he just pull them out of the air somewhere? Does he go to the Greek philosophers? Does he, what does he do? Where does he go? He gets it from the apostolic authority of the New Testament writings. And you see this over and over and over in this letter. It's just chock full of Scripture. In fact point, the early church, we could say, was saturated with the teachings of Jesus' apostles, which is the teaching of Christ himself, right? And you see this in his letter. It's just scripture after scripture after scripture. Polycarp, in fact, references 18 out of 27 New Testament books. So here they are 
Acts, 1 Peter, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, Luke. These are in order is what they appear in the letter. 2 Corinthians, Matthew, Galatians, 1 Timothy, Romans, Philippians, Mark, 2 Timothy, Titus, 1 John, Hebrews, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. The only ones missing is the Gospel of John, Colossians, uh, Philemon, James, uh, 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, Jude. I mean, that's quite an accomplishment because it's not a very long letter, right? And along with that, he does throw in some Old Testament Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the Psalms. So that's my point, is that the early church, Polycarp is an example, they were saturated with Scripture, apostolic authority. The apostles learned this from Christ, they wrote it down, sent it to the churches, and this is where I'm going to instruct you, Philippians, from righteousness or about righteousness. I'm not going to make this stuff up. I'm not going to go to Plato or Aristotle. I'm going straight to the apostles. This is what they say. Okay? And that really just, we need to probably point that out too, right? That, that myth that, I, that we talked about earlier that, you know, the church didn't have the, the New Testament until Constantine in the 4th century. Well, here we are 250 300 years earlier, they've got it. They've got it. A lot can be said about that, and that's really kind of a complex issue. But So, there's that point again for you. So, class observation. What was your first impression of Polycarp's letter? Those of you that had a chance to read it or read some of it, what was maybe just the first thing that jumped out at you? What, what did you think of this letter? Yeah, Joy. Yeah. Really, you could just pick it up as you're going and say, "Hey, that's familiar." Yeah, yeah. And also, how he ties them together to show the differences that were at hand. Yeah. Very practical. Yeah. So along with that, you know, picking up on the scriptural references, and I, I assume that most of you were able to see that very easily. What else does that tell us? This is. It's a long time ago, but yet we still recognize it as, we recognize those words. So what does that tell us? This book hasn't been corrupted. If Polycarp is teaching this in 130, 140 AD, and here we are in 2022 AD, and we recognize those same words, right? They ring in our ears as, oh, that sounds like Galatians. Oh, that sounds like Luke. That sounds like Acts. Well, what does that tell us? God has preserved his word. Anybody else? What was your first thought about this letter? Anything? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. What else maybe about the style here that maybe grabs you a little bit? Is it, does it seem like something else that you've read somewhere else? Yeah, sound, it could be a letter to Paul or from Paul almost, you know. It's, it's, uh, obviously, the content is a lot of Paul, but, but just the style of it, you know, the, the, it's a letter, right? There's an introduction, and then there's a body and several different points, and then there's a, a conclusion, and this... Boy, this could be like Ephesians, or it could be like Colossians, or one of the letters that Paul wrote. So, very similar style, I think. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 I think so. I think so. And that's a very good point, you know, he, he recognizes and honors Paul as being the, the one who founded the church in Philippi, and he, he gives him the utmost highest of respect, right? He doesn't drag his name through the mud or doesn't, you know, doesn't try to uh, downplay Paul at all. In fact, he does the exact opposite, and uh, a couple of times he lifts him up. So um, let, let's keep moving here because we're going to run out of time. I'm not sure how time got away from us. I'm probably talking too much again. But let's, let's take a look at the letter itself. If you didn't have a chance to read the letter, we're going to read through it here in class. 
Um, I, I, that outline there, that's my outline, my observations. There's nothing, um, nothing special about it. This just kind of, I read through it and thought, well, these are kind of nice, neat little um, breaks in the thought. So, so, first of all, we have the introduction in chapters 1 through 3 where it says this, Polycarp and the presbyters with him to the church of God that sojourns at Philippi. May mercy and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ our Savior be yours in abundance. And that just sounds like Paul, doesn't it? Or maybe John. Or, you know, it just sounds like just a normal letter. I greatly rejoice with you in our Lord Jesus Christ because you welcomed the representations of the true love and, as was proper for you, helped on their way those men confined by chains suitable for saints, which are the diadems or the crowns of those who are truly chosen by God and our Lord. And because your firmly rooted faith renowned from the earliest times, still perseveres and bears fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ, who endured for our sins, facing even death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pangs of Hades. Though you have not seen Him, you believe in Him with an inexpressible and glorious joy, which many desire to experience, knowing that by grace you have been saved, not because of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ." Therefore, prepare for action and serve God in fear and truth, leaving behind the empty and meaningless talk and the error of the crowd, and believing in Him who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave Him glory and a throne at His right hand, to whom all things in heaven and on earth were subjected, whom every breathing creature serves, who is coming as judge of the living and the dead, for whose blood God will hold responsible those who disobey Him." But he who raised him from the dead will raise us also, if we do his will and follow his commandments and love the things he loved, while avoiding every kind of unrighteousness, greed, love of money, slander, and false testimony, not repaying evil for evil or insult for insult or blow for blow or curse for curse, but instead remembering what the Lord said as he taught, do not judge that you may not be judged, forgive and you will be forgiven." Show mercy that you may be shown mercy. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And blessed are the poor and those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And he's just he's right there in the Sermon on the Mount, isn't he? I am writing you these comments about righteousness, brothers, not on my own initiative, but because you invited me to do so. For neither I nor anyone like me can keep pace with the wisdom of the blessed and glorious Paul who, when he was among you in the presence of the men of that time, accurately and reliably taught the word concerning the truth. And when he was absent, he wrote you letters. If you study them carefully, you will be able to build yourselves up in the faith that has been given to you, which is the mother of us all, while hope follows and love for God and Christ and for our neighbor leads the way. For if anyone is occupied with these, he has fulfilled the commandment of righteousness for one who has love is far from all sin. And we'll pause there. Any observations from that? Anything that sticks out to you? Yeah, Joy. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, and in, in, in the same way, we can kind of say the same thing today. You know, it's like, well, why, why come to a Wednesday night class? Why sit under preaching on Sunday morning, just, you've got a Bible, just read it, you know, go, go to the horse's mouth, so to speak, right? But God uses people to teach what has already been uh, authoritatively declared in this book, and, and it's just, uh, it's one of those great mysteries, I guess, of, you know, who is sufficient for such things to teach this book, and you kind of get that, you kind of get that uh, sense from Polycarp, he's like, well, you know, you don't really need me, but you asked me to do this, so I'll do it. Anything else? Okay, we'll keep going here because we've got a little ways to go. Chapter 4, he begins uh, getting a little bit deeper into this idea of righteousness. And he says, but the love of money is the beginning of all troubles, right? The root of all kinds of evil. Knowing, therefore, that we brought nothing into the world, nor can we take anything out, let us arm ourselves with the weapons of righteousness, And let us first teach ourselves to follow the commandment of the Lord. Then instruct your wives to continue in the faith delivered to them, and in love and purity, 
cherishing their own husbands in all fidelity and, and loving all others equally in all chastity, and to instruct the children with instruction that leads to the fear of God. The widows must think soberly about the faith of the Lord and pray unceasingly for everyone and stay far away from all malicious talk, slander, false testimony, love of money, and any kind of evil, knowing that they are God's altar and that all sacrifices are carefully inspected and nothing escapes him, whether thoughts or intentions or secrets of the heart. Again, we'll pause. Any thoughts there? Is it interesting to you that, you know, you have an opportunity to instruct this great church in Philippi, and one of the first things he does is he talks about family relationships. Isn't that interesting? Anybody have anything else to add? Okay, let's keep going. Chapter 5 and 6, he begins to apply this idea of righteousness and some practical issues, uh, specifically within the church, saying, knowing therefore that God is not mocked, we ought to live in a manner that is worthy of his commandment and glory. Similarly, deacons must be blameless in the presence of his righteousness as deacons of God and Christ and not of men, not slanderers, not insincere, not lovers of money, self-controlled in every respect, compassionate, diligent, acting in accordance with the truth of the Lord who became a servant of all, right? So uh, deacon, diakonos in Greek is the word for servant, right? So kind of a play on words there that he's using. If we please him in this present world, we will receive the world to come as well, inasmuch as he promised to raise us from the dead, and that if we prove to be citizens worthy of him, we will also reign with him, if, that is, we continue to believe. Similarly, the younger men must be blameless in all things. They should be concerned about purity above all, reining themselves away from all evil. For it is good to be cut off from the sinful desires of the world, because every sinful desire wages war against the Spirit, and neither fornicators nor male prostitutes nor homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of God, nor those who do perverse things. Therefore, one must keep away from all these things and be obedient to the presbyters and deacons as to God and Christ. The young women must maintain a pure and blameless conscience. The presbyters, for their part, must be compassionate. Uh, presbyters are the elders of the church, right? Presbyteros, elders. The presbyters, for their part, must be compassionate, merciful to all, turning back those who have gone astray, visiting all the sick, not neglecting a widow, orphan, or poor person, but always aiming at what is honorable in the sight of God and of men, avoiding all anger, partiality, unjust judgment, staying far away from all love of money, not quick to believe things spoken against anyone, nor harsh in judgment, knowing that we are all in debt with respect to sin. Therefore, if we ask the Lord to forgive us, then we ourselves ought to forgive, for we are in full view of the eyes of the Lord and God, and we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and each one must give an account of himself. So then let us serve him with fear and all reverence, just as he himself has commanded, as did the apostles who preached the gospel to us and the prophets who announced in advance the coming of our Lord. Let us be eager with regard to what is good and avoid those who tempt others to sin and false brothers and those who bear the name of the Lord hypocritically who lead foolish men astray. So we'll pause there. Any thoughts? There's an expectation here that within the church, the leaders of the church are, you better be walking in righteousness, right? Nothing new, really. I mean, Paul taught the same thing. John taught the same thing. But we see as, you know, the next generation of church leaders, we see them, you know, pushing this same thought through. You know, anybody else? Yeah, Joy? Yeah. Right, sure, yeah, yeah, servant of all, yeah. Lodine, did you have your hand up? (laughs) 
Yeah. 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 In fact, he says, look, if they're false brothers, if they're hypocritical, don't have anything to do with them. You know, Polycarp says, which is the same thing that Paul said. But Ignatius is really going to drive this home. You'll, you'll, if you read his letters this week, you'll, you'll see that. I mean, he really, he says, look, um, well, we'll that's next week. <laughs> We're already out of time. So uh, chapter seven, avoid error for everyone who does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is antichrist. So here we're, we're hearing the words of his mentor, John, and whoever does not acknowledge the testimony of the cross is of the devil. And whoever twists the sayings of the Lord to suit his own sinful desires and claims that there is neither resurrection nor judgment. Well, that person is the firstborn of Satan. Therefore, let us leave behind the worthless speculation of the crowd and their false teachings, and let us return to the word delivered to us from the beginning. Let us be self-controlled with respect to prayer and persevere in fasting, earnestly asking the all-seeing God to lead us not into temptation, the Lord's prayer there, because as the Lord said, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak, right? The words of Jesus the night he was arrested, right? Watch and pray, you guys so that you don't fall into temptation, and they fell asleep. So, chapter 8, continuing on, let us therefore hold steadfastly and unceasingly to our hope and the guarantee of our righteousness, who is Christ Jesus, right? So I think this is very important to note. You know, who is Polycarp pointing to as the source of righteousness? Is it our works? Is it the church? It's Christ, Christ alone. He is the source he is the guarantee who bore our sins in his own body upon the tree, who committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Instead, for our sakes, he endured all things in order that we might live in him. Let us therefore become imitators of his patient endurance. And if we should suffer for the sake of his name, let us glorify him. For this is the example he set for us in his own person. And this is what we have believed. Then he goes on in chapters 9 through 10, uh, talking about obedience to this righteousness. And he says, I urge all of you, therefore, to obey the teaching about righteousness and to exercise unlimited endurance. All right? Don't get tired of doing good and walking in righteousness. Like that which you saw with your own eyes, not only in the blessed Ignatius and Zosimus and Rufus, but also in others from your congregation and in Paul himself and the rest of the apostles. Be assured that all these did not run in vain, but in faith and righteousness, and that they are now in the place due them with the Lord, with whom they also suffered together. For they did not love the present world, but him who died on our behalf and was raised by God for our sakes. Stand fast, therefore, in these things, and follow the example of the Lord, firm and immovable in faith, loving the brotherhood, cherishing one another, united in the truth, giving way to one another in the gentleness of the Lord, despising no one. When you are able to do good, do not put it off, because charity delivers from death. All of you be subject to one another and maintain an irreproachable standard of conduct among the Gentiles so that you may be praised for your good deeds and the Lord may not be blasphemed because of you. But woe to him through whom the name of the Lord is blasphemed. Therefore teach to all the self-control by which you yourselves live. And then we come to this situation in the church um, regarding a man by the name of Valens, who is an elder in the church, and uh, evidently the love of money has been a problem for him. I have been deeply grieved for Valens, who once was a presbyter among you, because he so fails to understand the office that was entrusted to him. I warn you, therefore, Avoid love of money and be pure and truthful, right? So evidently, Valens has had some kind of moral failure and it has to do with the love of money. Avoid every kind of evil. But how can a man who is unable to control himself in these matters preach self-control to someone else? If a man does not avoid love of money, he will be polluted by idolatry and will be judged as one of the Gentiles who are ignorant of the Lord's judgment. 
Or do we not know that the saints will judge the world as Paul teaches? But I have not observed or heard of any such thing among you in whose midst the blessed Paul labored and who were his letters of recommendation in the, in the beginning. For he boasts about you in all the churches, those alone, that is, which at that time had come to know the Lord, for we had not yet come to know him. Therefore, brothers, I am deeply grieved for him and for his wife, for Valens and his wife. May the Lord grant them true repentance, right? And so then the question is, well, how should the church treat this couple who have fallen from grace, in a sense? You, therefore, for your part, must be reasonable in this matter, and do not regard such people as enemies, but as sick and straying members. Restore them in order that you may save your body in its entirety. For by doing this, you build up one another, right? And so, you know, he's instructing the church that, yeah, this guy's had a moral failure and he's running from the Lord, but, but don't despise him, right? Keep your doors open in case maybe he would, he would repent and return. For I am convinced that you are all well trained in the sacred scriptures and that nothing is hidden from you something not granted to me, so just kind of an uh, underlying picture of his humility here. He's saying, you know, you Philippians, you've got, you've got this book figured out, right? I mean, you were taught by Paul. I, I really don't have that ability, you know, it's just humility. I'm not sure if it's accurate, but it's very humble. Only as it is said in these scriptures, be angry, but do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger. Blessed is the one who remembers this, which I believe to be the case with you. And then uh, we have a sort of benediction at the end here. And now may the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and truth and in all gentleness and in all freedom from anger and forbearance and steadfastness and patient endurance and purity. And may he give to you a share and a place among his saints and to us with you and to all those under heaven who will yet believe in our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and in his Father who raised him from the dead. Pray for all the saints. Pray also for kings and powers and rulers, and for those who persecute and hate you, and for the enemies of the cross, in order that your fruit may be evident among all people, and that you may be perfect in him. And then there's some closing comments in the last two chapters. Both you and Ignatius have written me that if anyone is traveling to Syria, he should take your letter along also. This I will do if I get a good opportunity, either myself or the one whom I will send as a representative on your behalf as well as ours. We are sending to you the letters of Ignatius that were sent to us by him together with any others that we have in our possession, just as you requested. They are appended to this letter. You will be able to receive great benefit from them, for they deal with faith and patient endurance and every kind of spiritual growth that has to do with our Lord. As for Ignatius himself... And those with him, if you learn anything more definite, let us know, right? So as you study Ignatius' letters and you see something we don't see, you know, write us and let us know what you, what you learn. Again, a picture of humility. And he concludes by saying this, I am writing these things to you via Crescens, whom I recently commended to you and now commend again, for his conduct while with us has been blameless, and I believe that it will be likewise with you. And you will consider his sister to be commended when she comes to you. Farewell in the Lord Jesus Christ in grace, you and all those with you. Amen. And uh, we are way out of time. I apologize. But um, any last thoughts about the letter to the Philippians? Mm -hmm. what, what's that now? I'm sorry, I'm not following. Yeah. Yeah, probably not, because this would have been some time later. And it's just like today, you know, people have the same names. You know, lots of people are named Steve and, you know, Byron. <laughs> so, probably the same, same situation here. Probably a different Creskins, but I really had a lot more that I wanted to get to this evening, but uh, um, we certainly could. If we do that... Um, yeah, so you're, uh, let, let's, let's do that, because I, I really, we, we, need to, we need to understand the end of Polycarp's life, right? So his life ends 
Uh, he's executed for his faith. And that's really a very important thing for us to see. So your, uh, your homework for next week will be, to, uh, will be to read the martyrdom of Polycarp. You should have that already in your binder, okay? So we'll, well, there goes my eight-week schedule, though. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so next week the assignment is we'll, we'll, we'll remain with Polycarp for a little while and uh, read the martyrdom of Polycarp for next week. It's a little bit longer than this than this reading was, but um, like I said, this is not a have-to thing, but if you do it, we'll have a, a more fun time in class, so please do. So, Gary. Yeah, that's in two weeks. In two weeks, we'll have VBS, so we won't have class that week, um, but next week. So that, that's a good transition. We'll, uh, we'll get through Polycarp, then we'll take a week off and come back to Ignatius, so, so okay. That sounds good. I guess we'll do it. <laughs> I just get a thing and a plan in my head sometimes. Like, uh. there is. You're absolutely right. So I can see this turning into a year long study. <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your grace in our lives. And God, you have given us witness after witness after testimony after testimony of those who have gone before us, who have served you faithfully and have pursued truth at all costs. God, we thank you for your servant Polycarp and this letter that you have preserved for us to be able to learn from his life. God, I pray um, in light of all this, Father, that you would help us to hold firm to the righteousness that we have in Christ. Father, we live in a world that is um, so full of distractions, so full of temptations, so many opportunities to turn from righteousness and toward unrighteousness. But God, I pray that if we've heard anything from Polycarp this evening, Lord, that it would be that, a clear call to stand firm in the righteousness with which Christ alone gives. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to do this in our lives for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.